You guys want to wait a couple more minutes? You guys want to get started? Probably get started. Okay. All right. So, uh, just before Lance takes this away as the masters of ceremony. <laughs> uh, here's the rule: if if you got if you guys are not asking a question, I'll ask if you guys can mute your mic. So that way, if I like, just say like Stephen or Cody is asking Bill a question, there's not a lot of background noise to it. So if you guys have a question, you guys can unmute, ask it, and then we can go from there. Does that sound good? Sure. All right, bro. So, all right, Mr. Lance. Okay. Um, well, so there's a few questions on the Facebook page. Uh, Bill, is there one that particularly piques your interest? Well, uh, um, Stephen Laflame um, has once, as as he always does, has received <laughs> and written me a, a manifesto. <laughs> That's why I sent you the link. <laughs> so, uh, I thought I'd skip those right away. Uh, <laughs> um, hang on a second. Let's. Uh, Um, okay. Well, Alyssa is very, very question heavy, isn't she? I know, and look how concise they are. Yeah. All right. Um, first of all, any anybody that's on right now, let's let's start with them since they're actually here. Let's let's go with the. That's anybody a good got a idea. question? The Q and A. Just anything. Anything that'll start a conversation. This is not a lecture of any stretch of the imagination. This is just about talking, and everybody can contribute. Um, but I guess I'm. I'm in the hot seat as far as like initial responses. So just um, hey, Stephen. Since 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 you were very verbose, yeah. In your in your questions, do you have them in front of you? Uh, I don't, but I can probably summarize for you. Okay, why don't you why don't you give me the short <laughs> version? Since I I almost. Uh, uh, aged another year while reading your question. <laughs> it's been brewing for a while. Okay, fire, fire it up. Brother. Um, in terms of, I guess, do you manage, uh, I guess, how would you manage people differently based on their BC tests? Like most people that I see that kind of have a real uh, kind of deep thorax in the sagittal plane, uh -huh. We lack external rotation, horizontal abduction, and flexion. Yep. Whereas people that are more kind of narrow in the sagittal plane and wide yep. in the frontal plane seem to lack IR. Right. Um, I guess, how do you go about managing those people differently? Um, is there a difference in description for horizontal pressing and pulling versus vertical? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so here's the difference between the two, the two things that you're seeing, right? Um, one is actually a, simply a, a pelvis that is oriented in, in its rotation forward, okay? So, so put, put the whole pelvis together in one piece instead of the three separate pieces, okay? And just tilt the whole thing forward. So if, if we're looking at a bucket, we're tipping the bucket forward, we're pulling, pouring water out their belly. Okay. Right. So, so the thing that you're going to see with these people typically, and I say typically because not always, but typically what you're going to see, these are going to be the people that actually have pretty good internal rotation of their hips. Right. Um, now, there's, there's reasons for them to, to not, but a lot of times you're going to see um, a, a, a good hip internal rotation with these people. Okay. Um, they're going to have the wide infrasternal angle. Now, here's one of the cool things. Here, this is one of the cool things that I have sort of like accidentally discovered, and, and maybe I'm just stupid, and I, I should have known this before. If you look at the, the uh, infrapubic angle of the pelvis and the infrasternal angle of the rib cage, they actually match. Okay? Yeah. So I tell you what, um, I'm, I got my pelvis like right here. So let me grab it really quick, and we can go through this, okay? I was not prepared. I should have had my pelvis handy. No, it just has to kill this drifter real quick. All right. So, see the wide infrapubic angle here? Can everybody yep. agree with that? Like, just give me like a nod so I can see some heads. All right, cool. So, thank you, Campo. That was, that was wonderful. 
I'm, I'm sure when you get to the uh, ataxic portion of your neuro uh, section, you'll, you'll be a great volunteer for that. Uh, okay, so a wide infrasternal angle has a wide infrapubic angle as well, right? So that means that the pelvic outlet is wide open, all right? But what, they, what, what they're doing though, is they're rotating the entire pelvis and sacrum forward. So where the extension is actually occurring is above the level of the pelvis, okay? Which typically, typically allows them to have more internal rotation. Now, you can have people that are so far forward that they, they create a compensatory external rotation just like you would for like somebody that's like a, a pathological patient, okay? But typically what we're looking at is the entire thing's rotating. So we actually have a nutated sac sacrum which keeps the outlet open. Okay, so that's the wide infrasternal angle. That's the hyperinflated human being. Okay, um, more often than not, you're going to see a a sternum that that has the pump handle up. Okay, um, and so uh, if I put that person in quadruped, it's much more difficult for me to inhibit that extension component because I need I I need more than just are really good abdominal in that case, even though I, I need like crazy abdominal. So I'm, if I'm looking at, at a wide, in, wide infrapubic angle, wide infrasternal angle, I need, actually need external oblique to close that angle. It's the only muscle that's gonna do it for me. So I need help from, I need a much better hamstring pull to posteriorly rotate the pelvis. And I need abs to pull the ribs down into the exhaled position. So what I'll do with them is I'll typically put them in supine. All right, instead of putting their feet on the wall like you would typically do um, if you're following a three-letter acronym system, um, mm -hmm. what I would do then is, is I would put their heels on a, on a stool or a chair or something or a bench because you're going to get a much stronger hamstring activation in that, in that case. So because what we're trying to do in this circumstance, we don't have to open up the outlet. We have to inhibit the, the extensor tone um, through the, the spine. Does that make sense so far? Nod your head, Stephen. I'm, I'm kind of directing this one at you. Yeah, so is how you're determining the uh, infrapubic angle is just from looking at the infrasternal angle and you kind of hypothesize so, from there? It, let me throw you a curveball, brother, because if you, look, if you know what the infrasternal angle is, almost everything is predictable off of that. That's okay. how powerful that is. Because, because what, what that infrasternal angle is telling you, it's actually defining the position of the diaphragm. Okay, so if I have a wide infrasternal angle, what I have is a, is a very flat mm -hmm. diaphragm positioned in inhalation. What about like COPD patients and stuff where it's so descended it starts to pull it together? Okay, so, so, so this leads into the narrow infrasternal angle. So how does the infrasternal angle get narrow? So if I, if I descend the diaphragm, okay, and I hold it in, in a descended position and it contracts, it pulls inward. Yeah. So it's going to pull the lateral aspect of the ribs inward. And what that does, though, is it straightens the ribs. So when the ribs straighten, instead of having a wide infrasternal angle, it goes narrow. Because, so they're bent like this, right? So if I descend the diaphragm, the diaphragm pulls inward, it pushes the ribs straight like that, and that creates the narrow infrasternal angle. Okay. So, so the COPD, they tend to be hyperinflated people, right? Because yeah. the problem is they can't get air out, so they keep pumping air in, all right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so how would you go about treating those patients differently from a okay. wide versus narrow? Okay, so, so again, wide, I need more hamstring, and I need, um, I need a more aggressive exhalation because I need to recruit external obliques. So typically... I would not use an external oblique as, an, as a respiratory muscle because what external obliques do is they trap air. So if I over-recruit external oblique on a narrow infrasternal angle, what happens is I actually trap air because their ribs are too straight, right? So they never get a full exhalation. If I, if I put them in supine and I drive the, the – exhalation like I would for a wide infrasternal angle. So wide infrasternal angle needs an external oblique to close the angle. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I have a narrow infrasternal angle, 
their thorax is actually shaped like a dog, all right? So they will function best. So if I need to spread the angle back out wide, so I'm narrower than 90 degrees, I need to go to 290 degrees, I have to rebend the ribs because the ribs are too straight in a narrow infrastructural angle. Mm -hmm. So what I do then, if I put them in quadruped and I have them push with both arms, what I can actually do is I can, I can unpump handle the sternum, which brings the ribs back, which allows the serratus to pick up leverage, and then they can grab the ribs and pull them back. Because serratus cannot function on a straight rib cage. That's why when you see the counter-rotated thorax to the left, and the, and the, the left ribs are externally rotated, external rotation is straightening of the ribs. It's not that they're twisted out, they're straightened, mm -hmm. right? So that's why it's so hard to recruit a, a serratus on that left side, typically. So for the narrow infrastructural angle, they need serratus on both sides, but I have to bend the ribs backwards to open the angle back up. So that works better in quadruped or with like, you can use a bilateral reach sometimes because a lot of times the people are so hypermobile when they have the narrow infrastructural angles that they just can't support themselves and they'll, they'll like try to shrug to stabilize the shoulder girl. So then you want to move those people to the, uh, to the wall, like a wall supported kind of an activity. Okay. okay. But you're thinking more of like a horizontal reach forward versus a, a vertical reach up. Right. With a wide infrastructural angle, you have to hold the ribs up. Okay. And then pull down against them with the external oblique. That's what recruits the external oblique because it's a more aggressive exhalation. So they're already inhaled, hold them in inhalation, pull the lower ribs down. Or you said for the wide. For the wide external angle, arms have to be up. Okay. What, what, was, the, what was the reason for that? So if they're already in an inhaled position and I, and I'm, and I bucket handled the lower ribs up. Okay. Yeah. If they try to exhale really, really hard, what are they going to recruit in that position? They have no internal oblique. They have no transversus abdominis. So if they try to exhale really hard, you know what they're going to recruit? Yeah, Rex yeah. abdominis. Oh. They're going to pull down and they'll pull down on the, on the sternum. And then you get those people that look, that look like they're exhaled up top and inhaled on the bottom. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so using the, only go by the infrastructural angle. Don't go by the upper rib cage because in both cases I need inhalation here so I can get exhalation in the lower rib cage. Mm -hmm. So it's always arms up for a wide infrastructural angle to start. So like a lat hang, um, uh, supine hook line T8, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So are you, I'm thinking of myself personally, like that's exactly what I look like, like super depressed sternum and then just yeah, little rib flares down bottom. Do you, I mean, so getting the arms overhead would help pump yep. handle the sternum up at the same time as I'm trying to get right. the ribs down. So, so here's, here's reasoning for the overhead position. Okay. When I go overhead, I have to tilt the scapula posteriorly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the front side of the scapula, I have pec minor that's attached to ribs three, four, and five. Yeah. Okay. My inspiratory intercostals are, are around the sternum from ribs one through five. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything below five becomes, they're, they're exhalers. It's, it, we're very compartmentalized with our intercostal muscles, very much like we are with obliques. And if you, read, if you, have, if you don't understand what I'm talking about with the obliques, read Stuart McGill's um, research, because he's, he's shown the compartmentalization of the external obliques and such. But, so we use pec minor to hold the ribs up. We use external oblique to pull the ribs down and close the angle. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the, up, the upper rib cage position doesn't matter so much to me because my first order of business is to get the diaphragm in the best possible position. Okay. Would uh, the arms overhead help retract the shoulder blade too, where like restricted IR is from a overly protracted uh, scapula and supine? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's going to tilt posteriorly. It's probably going to externally rotate a little bit, but honestly, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking almost pure sagittal plane issue from the get go. Right. I got I to gotta shut off sagittal plane first. 
First rule of thumb, shut off sagittal plane. I got to get sagittal plane position and I've got to get the diaphragm in a, in, a, in a useful position as a respiratory muscle. Because if I got a wide infra strangle or a narrow strangle, they're not breathing with the diaphragm. They're using uh, accessory muscles. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. Outside of kind of working on those repositioning things, are there any just more fitness based exercises that you describe one or the other? Um, honestly, I'm driving like, 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 uh, stuff that, that will recruit the musculature that I need to make the change. So, so if I'm taking somebody out into the gym, um, I'm probably doing some form of like a, like a one arm push, like a cable, right? I can do chops and lifts, but I have to time the res respiration to cue the muscles that I want. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so think about reaching activities. Right, if I can, especially if I can reach from overhead, so like a chop. So there's my overhead position. If I can achieve an exhaled position, then I can actually use use that chopping pattern literally as my my replacement for like a table exercise in rehab. Because again, I don't want everybody to feel like they're a rehab patient. Yeah. Right? Okay. So not necessarily more. You know, it sounds like reaching for both versus. You know, maybe a row for one person. Other. Right. Well, I wouldn't use a row to make the correction on, mm -hmm. um, until they can engage the musculature that I need to control the ribcage position. Right. So, so again, there's your big argument against balancing pushes and pulls. I mean, if if you're one of those 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 people that that think that way, right? Because they're not they're not direct oppositions. Yeah. Right. So I, I can I can create all sorts of stuff that screws people up, but sometimes you have to sometimes you have to imbalance a program to, to help somebody. Sometimes you do an exercise on one side and you don't do it on the other side, and people are uncomfortable with that kind of thing. But again, what are you what are you trying to achieve? Right? Yeah, that that helps for sure. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I like it. Anybody else got anything? Bill. Can you go over again what's holding people in that narrow infrasternal angle? Yeah. So as the diaphragm descends, right, it leverages off the in, the internal organs. And it, should flip the, it should flip the rib cage out in a bucket handle fashion, right? Yeah. The lower ribs would go out. Yeah. Okay. That's our that's our wide infrasternal angle person. That's you. What you. Normal circumstances, yes. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, as it, yeah. so as it stays descended, and, and you're going to see the narrow strangles are going to show up on people who have a longer torso. So yeah. there's some mechanical leveraging going on here too, All right? But what happens with them as it descends? It descends far enough because of the of the length of their thorax, right? It descends far enough that it picks up leverage in, in the uh, frontal plane and it pulls the rib cage inward and that straightens the ribs. So instead of having a rounded rib cage as it descends and it's supposed to buck a handle, it does that. It pushes them forward and then that makes the narrow angle in the front. So if I bend these ribs back, it automatically widens the angle. You see how that works? Yeah, and that's all serratus right there, right? Yeah, well, it, if you can get it. Right. It's hard, to, and again, serratus doesn't work on straight ribs. It just can't, it has no leverage to it. Sure. Um, if you need a reference for that, um, it's uh, thoracic spine and rib cage by Flynn. Um, we'll talk about the, the fact that uh, serratus needs that for leverage. Okay. So then I remember you discussing with them too, you might almost even want to get uh, rectus abdominis with them in order to um, help pick help serratus pick up leverage or am I totally off base with that? Um, I don't really want it to be a, an exhaler, but they will try to use it as an exhaler. Sure. What you're really going to use um, is, is the, the push from the upper extremity. So we're actually using like a pec major under this circumstance yes. temporarily to pull it back into position. So mm -hmm. the idea is to achieve position to get leverage on the muscles that I want. Sure. Right. So if I'm pushing through the table in quadruped, the, the, the pecs will pull the sternum back, yeah. right, which bends the ribs. So now I can start to pick up some leverage with my uh, okay. uh, radius. So you, you're almost cueing like a hard push. 
I am. It, again, and a lot of those people are that from a, a stability standpoint, they can't control the scapular position very well. So yeah. sometimes they can't even do that. But then you go to the wall, like a wall supported activity. Why the wall? Um, so they can still reach forward, but but they don't have to deal with the, the oh, weight of their own body weight. Mm -hmm. and so they're still reaching back. forward. Gotcha. And, and you can be creative there. There's 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 no magic. It's just an easy way to transition and they're cool. still supported. Okay. You got more campo? You looked like you did. Yeah. Um can I just say that James has like serious beard power going on right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's dark too. Yeah. He must dye it. <laughs> Go ahead, Tampa. Um, iliolumbar ligament pathology. Yeah. How does that happen? Um, if you put stress on a ligament long enough, it gets longer. Oh, cool. What movements specifically would create that? So it's a transverse plane uh, pathology. So is it just a... How do I get to the... Okay, how do I get to the left side? If I'm, stuck, if I'm, if I'm right oriented, how do I get to the left side? Because I, I got a ligament that, that won't let me turn to the left. Right. But I've got forces that will try to take me to the left. So is it... Ligament is stuck as a, as a passive restraint. Always remember that. Repeat that, I'm sorry. Ligaments suck as a passive restraint. Right. If I put pressure on it long enough, it gives way, it will get longer. Right. We see it everywhere. We see it in hips, we see it in shoulders, and we see it in the spine, and especially the upper cervical spine, um, which we don't talk about very much at all. Um, but is there anything specific that's driving that pathology? Or is it just- My like desire to go to the left when I'm oriented to the right? So there's nothing specific that should be like inhibited or there's nothing specific that's really trying to drive that. Are you trying to prevent it? Or are you trying to, um, well, if, it, uh, if, it already, so if it already happens, something's driving it, right? Yes. It, it would be your, your attempt to get to the left. So as long as I am able to reposition them to the left, mm -hmm. we're okay. But then I still need to. There's, there, there would be no tension on it then, right? Because mm -hmm. the pelvis would be able to come around um, with it. Okay. okay. It's, it's, just, it's just tension. So, okay, so I have, a, I have a body that's oriented to the right, mm -hmm. and then my thorax is going to try to counter rotate back to the left. Mm -hmm. Well, so I have, I have a constant air, increase in airflow on the left side. Okay. Right? So I have more inflation in the left lung than the right lung, correct? Yes. So it straightens the left ribs. It pulls in the right ribs tighter, which creates a left rotational uh, moment through the spine right. against the right orientation. So there's your driver, if that's what you wanted to hear. Just Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyway. They had the right adductor from the other end. Right, right adductor and left glute, and you could you could go bottom up. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, okay. Anybody else here? Actually, uh, Alyssa, are you the one who left a bunch of questions on the Facebook group event thing? Yeah. Do you, do you want to uh, ask one or two or yeah. ten of them? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Here she I, was, is. I was interested in uh, breathing. Right, which I, um, I was interested in, what is the position that when you're initially working with somebody, are you gonna start them in breathing where you find that they can get the most, um, the understand the best way to inhale like into the back and into the body rather than breathing into the chest and the small uh, neck accessory muscles? Uh -huh. So that would be my first question. So, so what was the actual question though? Oh, sorry, I was chewing a uh, trail mix. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, what position do you start your clients off with to introduce, here's a more efficient way to breathe? Okay, so, so let's clarify one quick point. Oh. Um, there is not one efficient way to breathe, okay? Mm, the goal is okay. to reestablish as many ways to breathe as possible. 
Okay. Ah. And we do that by inhibiting. See, the, the, the problem that people have that limits their ability to move is that they only have one way to breathe. Mm. Okay. So there's not an ideal. There is an ideal based on context. So if you're, let me give you an example. If you're doing a side plank, mm -hmm. you don't breathe the same way as you're doing a push up. Okay. You don't yeah. breathe the same way as when you're touching your toes. You don't breathe the same way as when you're hanging from a chin up bar. Do you get an, an you understand what I'm getting at now? Yeah. So there's like a gajillion different ways that, that, that we should be able to breathe and access movement. The, so, so if we can't breathe in a certain position, guess what th happens? We don't go there and we can't go there. And the brain knows that because it's not stupid. The brain's 2% of your body weight consumes 25% of your oxygen. So it wants air. So we'll always make sure that it has access to air first, even if it has to sacrifice movement, even if it has to cause you pain to do so. One of the reasons people have pain is because if they go somewhere else, if they go into the pain, the brain doesn't like that because then it's going to suffocate. Okay. So... Uh, the smart ass answer to your question is I put them anywhere I have to, to get the response that I want. Okay. So if they're having issues expanding the, the posterior rib cage, mm -hmm. then I probably don't want to lay them down. Okay. So I might teach them how to do it sitting up. Mm -hmm. um, if, if they're, if, I, I don't have to worry about that. Then I can lay them down on their back and I can work more on, on like an exhalation position. It all depends on what I need to do to be successful. So I'm not, I'm not stuck into one pattern. Um, I will say this, that if, if there's like a position to teach people the most, it's usually laying on their back and with their legs up. All right. What you want to do is, is provide them um, a, a position where the diaphragm in the pelvis Actually, if I can hint at my talk coming up in August. Is it August? August 4th and 5th. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for the help there. I didn't know when I was going to talk. Um, there are multiple diaphragms in the pelvis, but we'll get to that. Um, so, so I want to put those diaphragms in an optimal position um, relative to the thoracic diaphragm because if, if, if they're out of position, that's one of the reasons why they usually come to see me, right? Because they can't access a certain position. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so whatever I need to do there. So, so sometimes I'll put them on their back with their legs up in that, like that 90, 90 position and mm -hmm. I'll stick a towel under their behind and I'll tip their pelvis back for them if they can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll sit them in a chair and I'll have them slouch a little bit. Sometimes I'll sit them down on a step. That's like a, like an eight inch step off the floor and I'll put them there. Right. Sometimes I just have them stand up and lean forward on, put their hands down on a table it all depends, right? There's, there's no right, there's no wrong. The, the goal is to get the response that you want. And the thing that drives your decision-making is what your tests tell you is the limitation. Does that, does that help a little bit? I mean, it's kind of vague as far as like the absolute because I don't have one. Sure, sure. No, it's uh, coming from uh, the Pilates world and being very into a particular type of breathing and then realizing right. that when I got into kettlebells and strength training, it had so much more background in science rather than in choreography. So um, yeah, no, it's, it's very fascinating because they're very hell bent on breathing one particular way. And that right. was my initial introduction to let's start breathing like this rather than into the neck, which is fine. But it doesn't mean it's, you know, it's like it's good to know, but it doesn't mean it's great or it's the most useful. Right. right? Yeah. So the, the way I always describe this um, is uh, if you lock your keys in the car. Yeah. How many different ways are there to get into your car and get them? Multiple. It kind of depends, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. If your car's on fire and your kid's in the back seat and you locked your keys in the car, what's the fastest way to get in the car? Smash the window. Yeah, but you don't want to do that all the time, right? Because if, if I'm not in a hurry, it's a nice sunny day. I call the locksmith, he comes out, we chill out, right? Or I right. call my buddy that's got the little Jimmy thing that you stick yeah. down in the door because he's good yeah. at breaking the cars. Right. right? So, so there's a gajillion different ways to get my keys out of the car, but it all depends on the context and what my needs are. And then, so, so your job as, as therapist, trainer, coach is to determine like, okay, what is, the, what is the context of this situation? What's going to get me the fastest result? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where you start. So I don't think there's a right or a wrong. And, and, and I'll tell you what I'm really cool with 
is I'm okay with not knowing the answer because a lot of times you got to figure it out. You got to try stuff and you got to fail. And then that tells you, okay, next time I see this, I'm probably not going to start here. I'm probably going to start with something else. Humans are very complex. Everybody that walks in is an N equals one scenario to you. Now we're, we have common physiologies. We have common structural constraints. So some of the stuff isn't all that impossible to figure out, but everybody's going to have their little nuances and, and somebody's going to be comfortable. Some people don't like to blow up balloons and I'm cool with that. So I don't make people blow up balloons. Some people don't like to put anything in their mouth when, when they're, when they're breathing, I don't put stuff in their mouth. So, you know, right. you have to have options, right? To create options. Right. And that's, Cool. Like I said, we don't want to lock people. What, how, what, we don't want to mummify people into a posture. We don't want to mummify them into position. The idea is to give them enough variability of movement so that they're adaptable in multiple contexts that, that they want to participate in. That's the goal, right? So never think one, always think many. What mm-hmm. gets me the many is to inhibit the one that they're stuck in. Right. Makes sense. Okay. okay. That's great. That's amazing. Jesus, somebody write that down. That was freaking cool. <laughs> I'm on it. Um, can I ask more questions? I don't want to be a microphone. Well, mob. Yeah, go for it. You posted a bunch of them. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, I was just following directions. And, and you did a fine job. <laughs> oh, these. thanks. thanks. Um, okay, so this is still going along with the breathing. Do you ever cue pelvic floor for men or for women? No. Okay. Can I, have, me? Yeah, no. <laughs> can I have more of an explanation? Is it just because it's unnecessary? Why would, you, why would you cue something consciously that I want it to, to occur consci- uh, unconsciously like that? Most people can't feel it anyway. Uh huh. It's like you might, because you, you, you try hard enough and you do the Kegel thingy, you know? Right, right. But, but the, the, the problem with cueing is like, I, I can't tell if I'm doing it right or wrong. It's like, what, how do I measure that? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Right. So, so here's the cool thing. If I can identify pelvic position. Right. And if I can identify rib cage position, mm-hmm. I kind of know where the uh, pelvic diaphragm is Yeah. as far as its position. And then if I know where that position is, I know what my extremity test should be. Mm-hmm. Okay. And mm-hmm. so then they kind of confirm where I'm at. And then they can tell me what position to put somebody in so they can automatically turn it on. Sure. Okay. About the only conscious thing that, that I really cue is um, the exhalation. So I need to make that conscious for a while. And then maybe some reaching. In general, the rest of the stuff, you want to try to make it as, as um, unconscious as possible. Like so, Sometimes you – sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's my alarm. I have to get ready for bed. Um, so, um, you, you want things to be as as natural and comfortable and automatic as possible. And, 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 you know, trying to mummify somebody, you know, the the thing I always tell people is like, there's no such thing as good posture because how do you know when you're there? Nobody ever knows when they're there. Okay. Mom might think it looks pretty, but you know, she doesn't know what spine angle you've got. She doesn't know the relationships between each vertebra. She doesn't know what your lumbosacral angle is. She just knows that it looks pretty when you sit up straight. Um, and that doesn't guarantee that we're in a good position for anything. So again, I, I go back to the fact that we never want one, we want many. And, and let the brain figure out what's the best thing to do under the circumstances. But you have to have those options available to you first. Okay. That's my long answer to a very short question. So. I like it. Does this mean you have to go to bed now? No, no, I'm staying up. <laughs> Can I offer a little bit more on that? Absolutely not. This is my talk. Shut up. <laughs> go ahead. So uh, I have a, an online client in Colorado, and we were talking through, similar to the pelvic floor thing, and similar with the uh, breathing, I guess, uh, train that we've been on, but he's constantly trying he's heard abs are good for you right he's taken a few pri courses and abdominals are something that you need because you're hyperinflated and so he tries to consciously cue them on everything that he does and he's found out that nothing that i try to give him ends up working because he's he's cueing himself into dyssynchrony he's cueing conscious unconscious things consciously so it's the same kind of thing with the uh 
the pelvic floor stuff. Sometimes there is a, a psychological barrier that you might not be aware of that you might need to pry into a little bit. Okay, cool. What else you got? You whole... finished the end of the question. <laughs> I, know, I mean, there's at least four more. <laughs> oh my God, so many, so many. Um, so kind of off the beaten path, the, uh, the what are they called? Oh my gosh, the seven, uh, the deep fascia lines. Okay. Um, do, does that, like, um, I did massage therapy for a little bit, and so we had learned about it, but even now in training, do those sev those fascia lines, the deep fascia lines, do they really play a part in, like, what we're trying to do with people? Like, is it good that, like, oh, good, you know it, but does it really make a difference? You mean or, the themselves? Um, or just, like, when you're assessing people's movement and – looking at things and knowing like, okay, this person has chronically tight neck. We know that they consistently breathe into their neck and their chest, but we also know that that fascia is related to the inner thighs. And does that have anything to do with the firing patterns? Am I asking the right question? I, I think I know where you're going, but let me, let me, can I ask, answer your question with a question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Is fascia continuous? Oh, this is a good test. Can I say yes? You can say yes. <laughs> I, th I think it is. Am I right? Yeah. So, so, so essentially, there's, there's, her, you know, there's stuff coming up all the time. And you don't have a lot of time. What, what? They're paying so much in rent. And hey, hey JP, that? can you mute? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> they're paying so much in rent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so. Okay. Well, that was it. JP, can you mute um, me? I think it's down. Atkin stuff. Are we good? Hey, I've always been a hustler. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I have uh, I've nope. sent a message. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Yeah. Are we okay? Can I talk? Oh, there we go. We're good. Go for it. Friend. Yes, okay. thank you. <laughs> right. so, so let's go back to Alyssa real quick. Yeah. Okay. So the answer I said is yes. It's okay. continuous. So, so fascia is one piece, right? Okay. It, and it covers everything. It covers organs. It covers bones. Um, it covers muscles, right? Okay. okay. So if it's continuous, couldn't I make a line anywhere? Dang. Yes. The answer okay. is yes. So, so, so what are we looking at really then when like, if you're, you're making reference to like Thomas Meyer's stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so I could make a fascial connection anywhere. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and let's understand what fat, like, okay. And this is Bill's opinion. <laughs> fascia doesn't do much other than it's a giant suit of sensors. And so it provides me sensation more than anything else. So it can identify tensions and pressures and, and, and movement across and things like that. So, so in my mind, that's what the fascia is for, right? So it doesn't have a mechanical property so much. I mean, it's hard to move. You can't change it with your hands. Um, you need a knife in most cases, unless we're talking about nasal fascia, which you can move. Um, so we're not really affecting fascia so much. Um, especially when doing like body work and things like that, what we're doing is we're signaling the system um, through that tissue via maybe your skin, via maybe your muscle, via maybe bone. So I don't get hung up on, on fascia as a driver of, of anything other than the sensory inputs. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> to, to your question, if we know where things attach, then we can start talking about relationships. So, so the, 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 the coolest one to talk about um, is, is if we're looking like on the back side of the body. So if I got biceps femoris where it attaches the ischial tuberosity, and then I got the sacral tuberous ligament that goes from, from uh, um, the ischial tube to uh, the sacrum and the posterior uh, ilium. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a, a plane that will go up through the erectors on the ipsilateral side and the contralateral side. So I have relationships there. So that's like a cool little relationship, but I don't follow it based on fascia. I just look at the connections of stuff. Right. 
Um, so yes, I do think about that, but I don't think about it as a fascial plane kind of a thing. I just say, okay, what else is attached here? What movement is occurring? And then what does that muscle do under those circumstances? So, uh, and if you can picture what a muscle's doing in three dimensions, mm -hmm. then you can kind of figure stuff out pretty easily, right? Yep. So, you know, as I, um, if I internally rotate my left hip, okay? Mm -hmm. If you look where the psoas attaches on the lesser uh, trochanter okay. of the femur, so that rotates down and inward kind of behind me. Mm -hmm. So that would pull the, the, the psoas in that direction, right? Mm -hmm. And because of my, my psoas attachments on, on T12 uh, through all the lumbar spine, it'll rotate my spine to the right. Kind of cool, mm -hmm. right? So what happens if I rotate my spine to the right and then take any other attachment along the, that, that chain of events, and I'm gonna have an influence somewhere else. Right. So if I rotate my spine to the right, guess what? My diaphragm picks up leverage on the right side. That's pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. so again, it's just, it's, it's just looking at a chain of events. Like what else is attached there? Because I can, I can take it anywhere because I can have a compensatory movement there too. So it, it doesn't have to follow, but it could be something that I don't expect. And so this is a really good point that you brought up because now we can discern between, okay, what is my expectation based on my findings and what, what is in conflict with that? So like if I'm assessing someone and I look at their pelvic position or whatever, and I say, you know what, under these circumstances, when that that left ilium rotates forward, that hip should be in flexion, adduction, adduction, and internal rotation. But guess what? It's not. It's in flexion, abduction, and external rotation. That means I've got a compensatory movement that occurred at that hip. And now I can say, okay, what structures had to give way for that to occur? Mm -hmm. Now I can start thinking, okay, where do I not get proprioception? Where do I have to create a, a mechanism for them to actually feel something with a muscle because I had soft tissue that I had to let go to get there? Right. So, so again, so I don't think it's a, it's a bad idea to have those things as a frame of reference. Okay. But I don't think that way because I don't, I don't think, and again, this is me personally. Um, I just don't think fascia works that way. I think it's more of like for sensation purposes and, and allowing us to sense things um, as far as position and movement and, and such. Right. Right. So that, Again, yeah. long answer to a short question. No, that's really interesting. It's great. Okay. Good answer. Thanks. I can't say that it's true, but yeah. that's how I think. <laughs> I like it. You can share that with someone if you'd like. I, you I will. Claim it as your own. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I, I'm going to go to the massage therapy school, and I'd be like, do you know what Bill Hartman said? He said that yeah. myofascial yeah. massage does not really exist. <laughs> Think about it. If it's continuous, I mean, seriously, that first rule of thumb, fascia is continuous. Well, then I can make a line anywhere I want. Unbelievable. Right? Interesting. But, but it's not a mover. It doesn't move anything. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's got contractile cells in it, but, but they don't have enough force to do anything. But they can take up slack, maybe help me with position, give me some sensation. Right. And then my brain can feel that and go, hey, you know what? I need to turn this on. Okay. Can I, since I'm taking up all this time. Um, you know, the ligaments and stuff that we were talking about before? So ligaments are specialized fascia. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, cool. So they're they full of sensors, right? So, so are they really there to stabilize things? Or are they just there to feel things? Hmm. Feel things. So what happens when you stretch a ligament 6% of its length, beyond 6% of its length? You're in trouble. It tears. Okay, good answer. All right. So it's not a very good stabilizer. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the epidemic of ACL should tell us that right away. Um, the amount of laxity that we see in people's shoulders on a regular basis and their, their upper cervical spine should tell us right away that, it, that ligaments are pretty lousy stabilizers. They're there for sensation. Campo, shut up. Um, so uh, um, so they're, they're lousy stabilizers. So they get stretched out easy and then we lose that sensation. And then we have to f have some sort of undesirable muscle activity to compensate for the fact that we don't have good sensation there. So then we create compressive forces that allow us to feel things that the fascia is no longer giving us and that the muscles can't give us. And now I know why people have compression syndromes in their low back and in their neck and, and in their knees and things like that. So they create compression so they can feel. Mm. Oh, yeah. Cool, huh? 
It's very cool. Yeah. Cool. Campo, did you have a question? Do you have a, um, a reference for that 6% of the... I read it a long time ago, back when I was your age, I think. <laughs> okay. It's dust. Let's, let's put it this way. They do not... They, under high force, they don't stretch well. Right. Okay. They would just assume... Um, if you take some silly putty... Yeah. Okay, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They still make that? Because I, that was, that's what I told you when I was a kid. I don't know. Okay, cool. So if you take silly putty and you stretch it really, really slowly, it makes a really long string, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so silly putty is a viscoelastic type of, of, a, of a substance, which is what our, our connective tissues are like, right? But if I yank on a, a, a silly putty, it snaps evenly, okay? A ligament kind of functions like that, right? but I don't think it's a great stabilizer. If you look at the calcaneal cuboid ligament on the bottom of your foot and you see how tiny it is, it's like that's there to signal when that space between the cal calcaneus and the cuboid expands. And then that tells me to turn on my foot intrinsics to keep that, that separation from occurring. That's what that's for. It's not holding anything together by any stretch of the imagination. It's too small. Then, how do you explain things like, um, like evulsions, like bony evulsions? Okay, so again, if, if, I, if I move something really, really quickly, that viscoelastic function, okay, it's stiffer. So a ligament will function stiffer. If at that moment, if that ligament is stiffer than the bone, it will evolve. Timing, pressure, location. There's, there's seven components of force that you have to deal with under every circumstance, okay? Magnitude, load, direction, duration, frequency, variability, and rate. They will all determine where something happens. Okay? And so you just don't know where that's going to be. So if at that moment the bone is relatively softer than the ligament, then you will evolve. It's just a matter of, of what property I'm looking at. Bones are soft too. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Right? But force will determine how a tissue behaves. So if I jump up and down, and if my bones didn't bend and give way and, and act as shock absorbers, they would snap. Yeah. Okay? And so a ligament can do that too, or a bone can do that too. It all depends on where the force is applied and at what moment. Simple physics, my friend. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's simple physics. Physics. Maybe not when you apply it to the calcaneal cuboid ligament. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, uh, what were those seven components of force for our notes here? Magnitude, load, direction, duration, variability, and rate. Duration and variability? Magnitude, load. You like that in the chat. That no. Okay. I only have it memorized in my head. <laughs> in, in the same order. <laughs> It is in the same book. Yeah, oh, I know. <laughs> you told me the page where that was from. What textbook's that from? Um, it's it's right behind you on the shelf on the other side of the refrigerator. <laughs> it's in the uh, biomechanics of musculoskeletal injury. <laughs> the page will be marked. <laughs> oh God! Oh, I have magnitude, load, frequency, direction, rate, magnitude, duration. Load, direction, duration, frequency, variability, and rate. Variability. Okay. Got it. Uh, we have six more minutes before Bill has to get tucked in. Does anybody have any other questions? Maybe, maybe not Alyssa, but I could give one to Alyssa if no one else has anything. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Who is who's my speaking? Name, my name is Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Hi. Patrick. Hi um, I was just wondering. I guess it depends on the person, but how early would you begin to integrate barbell exercises, deadlift, squats? Um, bench pressing in rehab in rehab um, very rarely um, mainly because so so here's what happens with a barbell um, and this is going to be my bias towards what rehab is and what what training is in, in the rehab environment, the goal is to try to restore as much variability to the system as possible because there, it's impossible to tell what the limiting system is as to why someone is seeing me for rehab. So if they're coming in with pain, okay, I don't care where the pain is, 
um, in, in general. Um, I obviously mm -hmm. I do care, um, but but my goal with with rehab is to tr try to store restore as much movement variability to the system as possible. So to give as many movement options as possible, because I it's impossible for me to tell what the limiting factor is. So if I restore maximum variability in the movement system that I can, and theoretically in every system at the same time, because I think we're affecting multiple systems, right? Mm -hmm. So if I can store all that variability, then the brain has the capacity, the brain and the body working together, obviously, has the capacity to sort of find the right way to do stuff so it doesn't hurt so much anymore, okay? Mm -hmm. um, whereas if I take somebody into training and I have a specific goal in mind from a performance standpoint, I have to intentionally restrict variability to raise the level of performance. So that's why you can't raise the performance of everything. That's why I'll never be a great marathon runner and, and the world's greatest powerlifter at the same time is because they're, they're in such conflict with each other. And you have to think about conflicts um, when we're trying to raise multiple abilities anyway. So when we talk about a barbell exercise, and you think about where I have to grab it. So, so let's just use the bench press as an example. So I'm taking a double overhand grip, right? So I have, mm -hmm. as soon as I have grabbed both hands in the, in, in the same relative position on one object, I have restricted my variability. There are only so many movement options available. And so if I'm thinking rehab, like just strictly rehab, I'm almost never with a barbell. Um, just because it is intentionally restricting variability. Now, the exception to the rule is when I know that they have enough variability and then I can allow them to do that. So as if you think about progressions going from like a rehab uh, uh, environment into a performance realm, that barbell is going to be on the, on the far end of performance and, and pretty darn far away from rehab. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks a lot, Bill. Okay. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else that might be lurking or I can call on Steven. All right, Steven, what you got? Uh, it, it kind of a, along the same lines of Patrick's question, um, like, you know, with PECs and things like that, that absolutely need to do single leg exercises, but I'm thinking of the ones who kind of can't, is there a scenario where just getting them on two feet and just trying to feel the ground with, you know, deadlifts or trap bar deadlifts, could that be beneficial in and of itself versus not knowing how they're stabilizing, just compensating like crazy just to try to get in a split stance or a, a single leg squat, you know, things like that. Yeah, there's, there's probably a, a scenario where that might be useful. I mean, um, but, but again, so you've got someone that, um, one, are, are we dealing with a pain related issue? Where, where are we in this, in this spectrum from, you know, from going from rehab, which is a, an, a very specific environment to reestablish variability and where are we trying to steal variability? Right. So I don't know where we are in that continuum, you know, just because someone has a, a bilateral extension pattern doesn't mean that I have to restrict them from everything because again, I, you need to define a context for me. Um, and then maybe I can say, yeah, I would do that or no, I wouldn't. So um, let me give you a, for instance, then. Um, so if I have somebody that, that is training for a powerlifting meet and they they, they have a bilateral extension pattern. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Love it because it could enhance their performance. And again, I have to look at them as an individual. I can't say that across the board, but it, there could be somebody that I want to keep there because think about this. If, if I have to expend less energy to hold a pattern that's going to allow me, allow me to lift more weight under mm -hmm. that circumstance, wouldn't it behoove me to maintain that at least temporarily so I can perform well with the understanding that I'm putting myself at risk? Oh, uh, absolutely. I guess I was thinking more from a rehabilitation perspective where – you know, some patients that I've seen who, you know, maybe have had back pain for a long time and, um, you know, introducing deadlift patterns and hip hinge patterns. And, you know, I guess I feel like I, I stand a better chance of getting them to stabilize appropriately with those bilateral patterns. How do you know? How do you, okay. So, so now, you, now you've opened yourself up. Okay. So here's my question, right? Yeah. How do you know when you got it right? 
How do you know that they're stabilizing correctly? What is your measurement tool to tell you that they're stabilizing correctly? Are you eyeballing it? Oh, I suppose so then. Okay, now let me give you a scenario, okay, where you could use it to your, to your advantage, okay? If I have um, a bilateral extension pattern, but I, I have a counter nutated sacrum, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, that, that was actually one of, one of the other long questions that I posted. Okay, so, so if, if, if I have a counter nutated sacrum, and I can, if I can get them to recruit the pelvic position that I want in a bilateral deadlift pattern, then I could theoretically use that, that deadlift to enhance nutation of the sacrum. Assuming a lot of things that I can move the thorax backwards, right? So I can expand the posterior thorax with air because what that will do is restore my lordosis and then by loading the extensors under those circumstances where the extensors are actually in the correct position for that activity, mm -hmm. I will nutate the sacrum and theoretically reposition the pelvis. How, how, how do you determine that the sacrum is counter nutated outside of flexion intolerance? Well, okay, so that's a really good one. Um, how do you tell when you have, a, I'm gonna speak your language for a second. I'm gonna throw a three letter acronym at you, okay? How do you know when you have a patho PEC? The positive adduction drop uh, with a negative extension. Or? Uh, crazy straight leg raise or a deep squat with, with, a, with the inability to adduct, right? Mm -hmm. so you have all these potential pathologies that, that would occur that, that, that are a byproduct of a counter nutated sacrum. So Not all PECs are the same, my friend. So you're so, saying if they have pathology at the hip, they likely have a count, counter nutated sacrum. I wouldn't even say it's likely. I'd say it's an absolute. Okay. So if you, if you see, I, uh, I, that's kind of a ballsy thing to say, but, but I, I can't think of a scenario where I haven't seen one like that. Okay. So, so whether it's, uh, you know, extensive uh, extension drop, straight leg raise, any of those things, if they're, any of those indicate pathology, think counter mutation? Yep. Okay. Yep. Because if, if I have a mutated sacrum, the extension's occurring above the pelvis in the spine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I usually don't have the, the hip pathologies that you would see with a counter mutated sacrum. Okay. Thanks. Mm hmm. Can I ask right, a follow-up question? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, about this concept of establishing movement variability, then how do you feel about like restricting people to getting into dynamic valgus or positions that a lot of clinicians see are like, oh, that's bad? So you, you, say it one more time so I'm, I'm clear on what you're actually asking me. I guess, how do you feel about like in rehab, when clinicians try to restrict movement patterns, such as getting into oh, increased okay. dynamic valgus and lunging, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if that um, restricts movement variability. Sure it does. Absolutely it does. Um, we're going to have to talk about context again. So how much you're going to allow something to occur depends on understanding who you're working with and the elements of control that they do have, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in a rehab perspective, I'm very protective of certain things, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the thing that we never know. We never know how much is okay and we never know how little is bad or how much is bad. We can't tell. It's impossible to tell, right? Um, if if you, you just watch an athlete in slow motion and some of the things that they do, we would never ask somebody to do that in slow motion in, in, in a clinical situation. And they're doing it at mm -hmm. high rate of speed, right? So mm -hmm. valgus occurs a lot. Tibial rotation occurs a lot. Pronation occurs a lot. Um, pick any uh, movement that, that we can produce and, and you'll see it accessed any number of different ways. But 
there are elements that I need to control under certain circumstances. One, maybe to avoid a, a painful experience. Um, mm -hmm. Two, be protecting some tissues. Um, so if somebody came with like an MCL sprain, right, I might have to hold them out of a valgus um, at some point in time. Um, but once I begin a high speed dynamic activities, I know it's going to occur. And so I just have to make sure that I have the capability of, of every inf uh, joint that influences that motion um, to assure that they have all the options available to them so that I'm not driving them into something that may cause a problem. So I understand, I understand your question. Like we don't wanna restrict things. Sometimes we want people to be able to figure them out but we also have mm -hmm. to create a, we have to narrow a window of acceptable, and then now you have to be a clinician or you have to be a coach, and you have to say, okay, this is acceptable now, um, and then I can broaden that or I can narrow it depending on the context and then what type of an activity I'm doing. So as I move people through a progression of of slow and 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 absolute control, I have to allow that window to expand so they can explore and then actually gain the ability to control those things in different contexts, right? So again, we have to eliminate, as a general rule, we have to eliminate the thought processes of absolutes because there aren't any. It all depends on the context of the situation and what that person is bringing. We've got, we've got three elements to every context, and that's the human, the task that they're performing, and the environment in which they're doing it. And so we have to consider those three things. We don't have absolute rules. We have to be adaptable, just like we need a, a human to be adaptable. Our thought process has to be adaptable. The problem is, is that people don't have enough, an, enough scope of, of experience, a scope of thought, and then foundational understanding to, to determine like, am I in a safe zone or not? Um, there's a concept called a, a safe to fail. You've heard fail safe experience, experiments, which never fail, right? Well, we have to have safe to fail scenarios to allow people to figure things out. And, and again, that begins in, in a very protective rehabish kind of a, of a scenario. And then eventually that, that's what has to expand into the performance realm. That's why, why when, when we're talking about training somebody for some sort of specific level of performance, it ain't the same as rehab. It's not even close because again, rehab is to broaden variability to allow the, the system to um, adapt and, and be able to uh, 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 function in a number of, of environments, whereas performance is intentionally narrowing the variability of that system to reach a higher level of performance in one realm because we can't be great at everything at, at all at the same time. Ah, uh, that's interesting. Did that, that help? A, that is a very, very interesting answer, Bill. I'm going to have a lot more questions for you when I see you at the summit. Okay. <laughs> Buy me a margarita. Okay. I'll do that. Awesome. Appreciate it, Bill. You're very welcome. I hope I helped. All right, guys. Yeah, did. Um, thank you for listening and for asking questions. Uh, Bill, is there anything you want to add before I let you go to bed? Grant Gardis is on this call. He I is. I can't see him though. We got Cody, He's lurking. Drew. Where's Drew? Can't see Drew's face. I'm just looking at who's on here and who is so quiet. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> oh, Rufus. Is that Ruf? I don't know how to work this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the camera around so it faces you. What camera? <laughs> <laughs> It's the little lighted dot that's around the uh, border of your, are you using your iPad? No. Hang on. <laughs> it's not a beautiful in 60 pieces and 60 inches of TV though. So, so, so let me offer you this is that this is like one of the smartest guys I know in the Olympic weight, weightlifting world. And, uh, um, there he is. Oh, wow. Hey. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bad gun to say I ever tried to get on. <laughs> Rufus <laughs> makes you look like a technical wizard. <laughs> All right. I tell you what, um, let's do one more question if somebody's got a, a, a good question. Okay. Three, two. All right, Alyssa, what you got? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's time for bed. I totally understand. I totally understand.
I'm I'll, sure give you, it'll be quick. I'll give you four minutes. Okay, great. <laughs> I, do, I got a question. Actually. <laughs> Me too. Lissa, Lissa, somebody, somebody else is asking for a question. Do you mind? And Not I tell at you, all. if you post it, if you post it on the, uh, that's uh, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll make an effort to answer it. Okay. Great. Okay. Who, 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 who asked for a question? This is Patrick again. Ah. <laughs> so I want to ask now about performance training. You said it's restricting movement variability. Yes. Um, how do you determine um, which I guess movements to restrict it to? I guess it's based on the sport, but let's say, for example, if the sport is basketball, then what mm -hmm. are some examples of restricted movements that you would want to work on specifically? So, so we're, we're, we're talking about a multi-directional sport with multiple energy system demands and, and high levels of skill. So under that circumstance, I probably would not make a, a serious effort to restrict variability. I would make sure that they have a, a much more broader spectrum of capabilities. Interesting. Um, That's what I was thinking. Okay. But now, but let's, but let's talk about a, a hundred meter sprinter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're dealing with a different realm. Okay. So think the mm -hmm. level of specificity for a hundred meter sprinter, essentially one energy system, right? So we're going mm -hmm. ATP CP system, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, he runs in, in a, a three foot wide space and they even paint the white lines on the ground for him so he knows exactly where to go. So, that, so it's totally predictable. Um, if, if I give him too much variability that he has to control to keep himself in a straight line, he has to expend energy sideways and I don't want that. I want him to propel himself as, far, as fast as he can in a straight line. So mm -hmm. I, want, I want him lined up in that direction. So I don't need the same um, mobility uh, uh, capabilities in a sprinter as I do in a basketball player. So it's, it's better to make a comparison between things when we talk about um, enhancing performance. So, okay. Um, so another thing, so what if we just had like, a, and again, when you look at single event stuff versus field sports, that's where the radical differences occur. So like um, a high jumper, what does he need to be able to do? He makes a small, if he's, a, if yeah, he's a, yeah. jumps off his left foot, he makes a small left hand turn. Okay, he's gotta be able to do that. And then he's gotta be able to jump really, really high off of one leg. That's pretty restrictive, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. um, I don't wanna pack any muscle mass on that guy. Um, he, he needs enough energy to do enough jumps to win a meet. So you know, depending how good he is, maybe he has to take nine to 12 jumps total. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all explosive. They're all at one end of the mm -hmm. energy spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. And he needs a lot of sagittal plane mobility. But again, I don't mm -hmm. want him to have maybe a tremendous amount of frontal plane mobility. I just need enough for him to make that left-hand turn as he's approaching the bar. So again, you have to look at the demands and you have to say, well, what would, be e what would make this job easier? If I'm a power lifter, do I really want to be able to, to twist? No, because if I twist under, under load, I'm expending energy to try to keep myself straight. So lock that sucker in the sagittal plane, and now I've got a guy that can expend all of his energy straight up into the bar. So, mm -hmm. so again, you, you just have to look at context, but you also have yeah. to understand what the consequences are, because every time I restrict mobility, um, my, my viewpoint is that I'm restricting any number of systems, not just the movement system, because it takes the nervous system uh. to do that. And if I, if I limit the, the uh, variability of the nervous system, I'm affecting every system in my body from, you know, blood pH to respiration to uh, digestion. Um, my reproductive stuff will shut down. I mean, you know, who knows what, what, what sequel will occur um, as, as I restrict or enhance variability. So again, I would look at, look at it from a comparative standpoint and that should guide you as to what you need to enhance or restrict. Interesting. That's very, very interesting. So, so that was like very interesting with a question mark at the end, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, I just had one, like, I guess, sneaky question, like, What's the best book you've read? The best book I've read? Yeah, what's, what's one book? Oh, actually, let's say, what's, one book you, what's one book you'd recommend for someone who's trying to gain some performance, sports performance training? How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> read that one already. You read it? How many yeah, times? I was planning on rereading that. I was, I was just planning on rereading that next month, though. Yeah. Um, 
it, 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 best book ever written um, still applies today. And because that's your client relationship, right? Yeah. You know, and that's what keeps you, business, keeps you working and, and, and gets you what you need out of that, that human. Right. Um, there, Definitely. There, there is yet to be a book written that, that, that encompasses enough things. Um, you know, if, if you, if you narrow down your, your, your topic, we could probably narrow down, you know, a couple more, uh, books, but you know, um, read the next one. Okay. Uh, just read the next one and then, you know, learn something in every, every, you know, I'm, I'm reading about water right now. Interesting. Yeah, I know. Water's fast. <laughs> Water's yeah. fast. All right. Tony, yeah. I'll down. let you go to bed now. Thanks brother. Now you're... <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. You done bill? Okay. Unless there's like a really telling question. No. Who's gonna bear their soul here? <laughs> I mean, I have plenty, <laughs> more. I have plenty more. If you want to keep going? <laughs> Patrick, I'm shutting you down. <laughs> you save it for next month. <laughs> okay. Um, what's your uh, What's your water book? Is it blue something? Uh, I got a couple of them. The first one is. <laughs> hang on. <laughs> um, it's called the fourth phase of water. Is that like? super critical points and stuff what do you mean by super critical points it's a it's a chemistry state it's, it's more of a, it's, so it's it's more of like a um uh, the way that water structures itself depending on the surface that it comes in contact with aaron is that aaron hey buddy hey. how you doing brother yeah, man. Good to see you there um, yeah, yeah so, so water actually takes on a, a, a different structure depending on what surfaces it comes in contact with. And, and so that means the distribution of its, of its charges um, will influence the, the mediums that it comes in contact with, which means that inside the cell, it will function like a battery, which is really fascinating. Sure, so when, yeah. When we, oh, think about, man. when we think about the polarization of neurons, how does that occur? Well, guess what? It may be, oh, look at that. I know. <laughs> um, when you think about polarization of neurons, it's like, it's like where, does, where does that gradient come from? And it could actually just be the charges in the water itself. Really? Reacting, get this, reacting to the surfaces it makes contact with and then infra, infrared light. It reacts to infrared light. That I don't believe. <laughs> it, it, it charges it like a battery. It's amazing. Oh, man. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, that's a bit next level. Yeah. <laughs> ultrasound <laughs> works is what you're saying. So they, so they actually test it with ultrasound. Um, they actually pump ultrasound into it so they can, they can try to alter the, uh, this. It, it creates a space between the, the contact surface and, and the, the negatively charged water. Yeah creates what's called an exclusive zone. And so, so they actually do tests by running an ultrasound across it to see that if they can destroy the, uh, the exclusive zone. So it's pretty fascinating. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, actually. I'm, um, I'm, it, it, is, it is more interesting than the best novel I've ever read. Is it purely nonfiction? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's all research. Sorry guys, I don't see Bill that often, so I we had to catch up there. <laughs> uh, everyone, wave hi and bye to uh, Aaron's children. Hi. <laughs> hi. Aaron's in Australia. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What time is it over there? Uh, nine thirty. A.M. In the morning. Yeah. Yeah, morning. Oh yeah. man. Um, and it's <laughs> cold. Just doing some of sessions. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. It's, it's never boring. cold in Perth, buddy. Never that cold in Perth. <laughs> yeah. well, nobody's ever asked me to come to Perth, so I, I don't know. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> one day, one day we'll drag you over. <laughs> I'll be there. All right, kids. All right, guys. Uh, I, I've been taking crappy notes this whole time. So if you want, then just uh, put a message in the group and I'll send them out to you guys. Okay. All right. I think there's a couple of pencils in it. Just a reminder, go ahead and post some questions on, on Facebook and then 
Like I said, I can't, I can't guarantee I'll get knock them all out very, very quickly, but post them up there. And move into it. I'm going to try to get Bill to give us one of these once a month, but uh, we'll, we'll see if the schedule allows. Um, thank you guys for being here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right, guys. Take care. Right, bye. See you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.